This is the 11th lecture for MA 1012. In this lecture, we want to figure out how to organize the calculation of solutions of linear equations. First, let's try to figure out what it means to be finished. When are we going to be finished our steps? What is it going to look like when we're done? And then we can try and figure out how to get there. Um, so we'll say that a matrix, um, a matrix meaning a bunch of numbers in rows and columns, um, is uh, is in row echelon form if it satisfies the following. The first condition is that all the non-zero rows, uh, that is to say with at least something non-zero in them, are uh, above any zero rows. So a zero row being row of all just zeros. Second condition is that the the leading coefficient, which is also called the pivot, leading coefficient is also called the pivot, and that's the first non-zero. Um, so that means the first non-zero entry, um, first as measured from the left going over, um, is uh, is always uh, uh, to the right of the pivot in any in the row above it. Let's put it that way. Uh, in the row above it. So the idea being something like as we go down, 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 we find there's some non-zero entry here. All these are zeros all the way along. There's your non-zero entry. There's your pivot. It's got some number in it that's not zero, which will indicate by just drawing it as a, as a circle with um, which isn't zero, so it's got some shit, you know, some stuff in it. So, um, so then, then maybe more stuff over there. So then, it has to be to the right of the of the previous pivot. So there'd be a pivot in the previous row here, maybe some zeros, then something, and then something, and it has to be to the right. So as, as we go down, we step down, down, down. We never go straight down. We always go. Uh, if we go down, it always move over to get to the next pivot, and so on and so forth. Okay, so something like that. So that's the, the definition of row echelon form. And there's a slightly stricter version um, of row echelon form um, that uh, says that, uh, we'll say that it's in a row, uh, it re sorry, reduced. It's reduced row echelon form if it satisfies the additional condition that um, every pivot is a one is the number one. So these these numbers that, that were non-zero entries, they're actually just ones. So we have some zeros, and then a one, some zeros going even further over, and then a one, and so on and so forth. Um, those are their pivots, a and um, we also require that um, uh, all entries above or below any pivot are zeros. Um, so that's the, the reduced row echelon form. So we could always aim for reduced row echelon form. It's faster to just go to row echelon form and, and then solve from there. But it's always possible to do reduced row echelon form. We'll see. So when we have something in row echelon form, it's got some, some zeros and then some non-zero entry. Then it's got even more zeros. Had to be strictly more zeros in the next one, at least one more zero the next one, and then some non-zero entry, and some possibly non-zero entries after that one, and after that one. So non-zero entries can be there, can be there, and so on and so forth. Um, and then at the end of the matrix, you'd have, only at the end, can you have all zeros. You could have a few rows that are all zeros, but they have to cure at the very bottom. Okay, so that's the, the picture of what the thing looks like. Okay, um, so that's what row echelon form looks like, and reduced row echelon form is slightly stricter uh, criterion. If we want it to be reduced row echelon, we have to have uh, that. It looks like, well, there's maybe some zeros, and then a one, and then uh, anything can come after that. Then a whole bunch of zeros, at least one more zero, and at least one, maybe several more zeros than a one, and then anything can come after that. But uh, but this is a one, so there has to be have been a zero above it and below it all the way down. So it has to be this would have to be a zero as well. So in the reduced row echelon form picture, when you get a, a one showing up as its pivot, the leading 
next entry, the first non-zero entry in its row, everybody has to be zero all the way up here, all the way to the top, as well as all the way to the bottom. So that's the, the reduced row echelon form. It's not just row echelon. And we can always get to reduced row echelon form, but it might not always be the computationally fastest way to come up with the answer to the linear equations. There's a bit of danger here in that the, the, the terms uh, which we've used row echelon and uh, reduced row echelon are used somewhat differently in different books. So you might come up with slightly different terminology in some books, and some, some authors don't distinguish the two. Some authors uh, say that when they describe a row echelon form, they require that it also have the properties of a reduced one, and so on. You can always reduce, you can always get to reduced form, as you said before, but it's not always the fastest way. You might just want to get just as far as a row echelon, and that might be good enough. For most linear algebra problems, it's good enough just to get to the row echelon form. You don't usually need to go all the way to reduced. When you look at a, at a system that's in this form, you look at, they say, let's say this system, then there'll be a bunch of variables. This will be, say, x1, x2. Before we had them called i1, i2, and so on, we have variables. Um, now, we can see that if there's zeros all the way down, then down here, this whole block of zeros, then you can't solve for any of those variables because you haven't got them appearing in any of your equations. But this one will solve for a variable, and this one will solve for a variable. So let's see if we can make it a bit more explicit about how that looks. If we were to have uh, some kind of matrix that looked like, um, let's say, uh, 0, 2, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 4, um, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Um, maybe we'd have our augmented matrix, um, 0, uh, 1, 9, 7. Let's put some more entries in here. We can put any junk in here we want. We, if, uh, this isn't going to be reduced because that's not a 1. It's not reduced. It's definitely not reduced because it, to be reduced, the first non-zero entry in the row would have to be a 1. Um, so what are we going to get? We get, uh, well, we could put anything here. Minus 4, 2, 7, 19, 12, 8, minus 1, 0, 2, 4, 9. Okay, so some numbers doesn't matter. The point being, there's a kind of staircase form that goes on when it's reduced. Oh, sorry, when it's row echelon. This is this is not reduced, but it is row echelon. It is row echelon. Um, this is a row echelon matrix that's not reduced row echelon because that pivot there's not a one. But you can see the pattern, the sort of staircase pattern that's going on here. It goes on all like that. So these are the pivots when you take the step down and over take a step down over so that's a pivot and then that's a pivot and then you go along and that's a pivot you can see the pivots they're the corners in the staircase pattern um, but you can also see if you think of these as linear equations this is for some variable x1 x2 x3 x4 x5 x6 x7 and these are the constants uh, that occur after the, the bar that makes this an augmented matrix um, so you can see, for example, that there's no pivot in the x1 column. They're just all zeros. So that tells you you can't say anything about x1. These don't. These equations don't actually contain the variable x1. They don't, it doesn't appear in any of them because it doesn't have things that are all zeros. So there's not, no information in these equations about what x1 is. No, no information at all. Um, on the other hand, there's x2. Uh, here's a pivot. That means this equation could be used to solve for x2. It says something about x2 in terms of the other later variables. It doesn't matter what. You can use this definitely to solve for x2, as long as you can solve for all the later variables. So this is a perfectly fine equation for solving for x2. And then once it's used to solve for x2, you can forget about it and just use the remaining equations to solve for the remaining variables. And so you can see that the, the, the approach to having this kind of staircase effect, this row echelon effect, is that it means that we th treat each equation as solving for a variable in terms of later variables, which are solved for by the later equations. This one solves for x3 in terms of later variables, which are solved for in terms of later equations. This one solves for x5 because it's in the x5 column in terms of later ones. And this last one doesn't tell you anything because it's all just zeros. It just says 0 equals 0. So these latest lines with all the zeros and these rows of zeros, and they don't really tell you anything at all. Um, they're useless. This tells us, because we can see no pivots here, that there doesn't, there isn't any way to solve for x1. It's just free and doesn't have any effect on the answers. Um, so we can read off all of that. We can also read off whether or not there are any answers 
because we can see that this last equation can be used to solve for x5 its sum amount for x5s, it doesn't matter what amount it is as long as it's a non-zero amount of x5s in terms of the other variables. So I can solve this equation for x5 in terms of any values of x6 and x7. I can plug in anything for x, x6 and 7 uh, into here, 8 x 7 is here, 9 x6 is here, it doesn't matter what they are, plug in anything at all and I can use this to solve for x5. So I can definitely solve for x5, x6 and 7 can be anything, I can solve for x5, I can use this equation to solve for x3, and this equation to solve for x2. So we can say that x2, 2, 3, and 5, and x5 are, um, are together um, functions, some linear functions of, there are variables that I didn't solve for, well x1, which doesn't actually appear at all in any of them, but in the other variables that appeared, so 2 and 3, we didn't use 4 yet, so if we put an, a value for x4 in, we'll be able to use it here to solve for x3, and in an equation that involves x4, 5, 6, and 7. So we'll be able to use these equations to solve for 2, 3, and 5 in terms of the other variables that we didn't use, and x1 isn't one of them because it doesn't appear at all. So it's in terms of x4 and x6 uh, and x7. So you can see that without knowing what the solution is. You can see somehow the, the geometry or the structure of the solutions because you know that these variables can be treated as varying freely. Um, and also, of course, x1 is completely free. It can be anything because it doesn't appear in any of the equations. So x1 can be free. It can be anything at all. x4, uh, 6, and 7 are free variables. They can be anything at all. And then you can read off the value of, in this case, is x, this solves for x5 in terms of 6 and 7. Then you can plug in that x5 into whatever its value is into here and use that to solve the remaining equations for x2 uh, and x3. So you can see the picture uh, by just drawing these little little staircase steps. You can see each step down and over, down and over. Each step is a pivot. Uh, each little corner here is a pivot. And each of the pivots solves for a variable in terms of later variables. And so we can see how many solutions there are, that there are infinitely many solutions, given by arbitrary values of these variables and arbitrary value of that variable. In particular, What's noticeable about this is that I could answer the question as to whether or not there are solutions and how many there are without actually solving the problem. I don't know what the solution is. I don't know how to solve all these equations. In principle, I could keep going and find the solution. But what I'm trying to point out here is that the structure of the solutions becomes clear when you reach rho echelon form. Once I get to rho echelon form, I see these little steps, each of these little corners here. That's solving for a variable, that's solving for a variable, that's solving for a variable. So I can solve for one variable at each of those corners, and each of those little steps downward um, gives me a solution for one of the variables in terms of later variables. And so I can see which ones are solved for, and then which ones are not solved for, which remain free. So I can see that there are, in this case, four uh, variables free, so there's four dimensions worth of solutions, and then the other three variables are solved for in terms of those. And I can also see which variables don't appear at all because they're columns of zeros. Um, if there weren't any solutions, I could also see that. That's worth pointing out. So if we wanted a simple example where there are no solutions, how do we see that there are no solutions? That's also easy to see in terms of the row echelon form without having to go all the way to reduce row echelon. You can already see whether or not there are solutions. If we look at a simple row echelon form, um, Suppose we have this system. There's a sim simple a matrix, uh, and you can see that it's again in, in the row echelon form because it uh, goes down and steps over, and then goes down and then steps over, and then goes down and steps over like this. It's got a staircase pattern. The stair steps can go over several steps and then down one, over several, down one. They only go down one at each, at each time. They can go over by several steps. Um, we can see that this solves for, if the variables are again called something like x1, x2, x3, and then these are the constants. You, that solves for x1 in terms of later variables. That solves for x3 in terms of later variables. So x2 is free. We haven't given it a, got an equation to solve for it. That's solving for x1. That there is solving for x3. There's no equation to solve for x2, so it's free. But the last equation is, is the problem. This is rather surprising. Because it's saying no x1s, no x2s, no x3s is equal to 5. And that can't happen. 
there's no way you could have, let's turn it back into an equation, there's no way you could have no x1s plus no x2s plus no x3s, so you haven't got anything, and somehow you've got 5. Nothing of at, uh, at all uh, is equal to 5. That's not possible. Um, that's not possible. So if that's not possible, there must not be any solutions. There are no solutions. And how do you see that there are no solutions? That's because there's a pivot here, and the pivot in the constants column. Constants column. Uh, that shows that there are no solutions, because that pivot has to be a non-zero. Pivot has to always be non-zero, but it has to be uh, zeros all the way up before it, and it has to be the first non-zero entry. So there's a pivot in the constants column. There are no solutions because you've got zeros all the way up to it for all the values for all the variables, all the, for all the multiples of the variables. And then you've got to, got to equal something non-zero, just like we did here. So that can't happen. So that definitely means there are no solutions. In fact, it turns out it goes the other way, too, that if there's no pivot in the constants column, then there are solutions because every time you have a pivot, occurring for a variable, well that pivot solves for x1 in terms of later variables, and you can set the later variables to anything. That solves for x3 in terms of later variables, you can set them to anything. And so when there's a pivot in the, uh, in the, away from the constants column, in any other place the pivot can lie, any of the other columns, it always solves for a variable. And so if there are, uh, if there's a pivot in the constants column, there are no solutions. But if there are no solutions, there must be a pivot in the constants column because if the if if there weren't, there then the pivots would all just be solving for variables perfectly happily in terms of later variables, and that would be perfectly consistent. So uh, so in fact, a pivot in the constants column is exactly when there are no solutions, and that's not immediately obvious. That takes a bit of thought, but when we manipulate these. Uh, these augmented matrices and get into the row echelon form, we can spot whether or not there's solutions. There's no solutions here because there's a pivot in the constants column. But if there wasn't a pivot in the constants column, you know, like in our previous example, then there definitely have to be solutions and we can see how many. So we can count off solutions. This is very important. We can count solutions without having to go all the way to reduce row echelon form. We don't have to know what the solutions are. We can already count them. And that's important because we can calculate that more quickly. Without having to do all the work to get all the way to reduced row echelon form, I can already see the structure of the solutions, the geometry. How many are there? And how many variables do they depend on? And in this case, whether or not there actually are any solutions, it pops out immediately from the row echelon form without having to go all the way to reduced row echelon. In the next lecture, we'll look at the problem of uh, trying to organize this into a, into a systematic calculation. So far, we have the rough idea that once we can see the row echelon form, we can see whether or not there are solutions. We can also see how many solutions there are. And, uh, and so getting there is important, but we don't know how to actually get it organized. We don't know the fast, quick way to organize getting uh, an arbitrary augmented matrix into the form of this row echelon. We have the rough idea as to how to do it because we've done examples, but we need to organize it into a system, and then we'll uh, we'll be able to use that to rapidly calculate with large systems of linear equations.